So today I'd like to talk about the current Rust ID story, more specifically underline some of the historic context behind it, and also talk about the tools themselves, which includes the design decisions behind them and their current capabilities. But first, a couple of words about me. Uh, most, most of us spend most of the time on GitHub and on Twitter rather than in real life, so chances are you probably recognize me more by my handle and by my avatar rather than by my real name. I'm the maintainer of the Rust language server. I started my journey with Rust in 2017 as a Google Summer of Code student. So there I worked on the RLS itself under Mozilla organization. And I'm the member of the official DevTools team and the DevTools themselves are my primary area of focus for me in Rust itself. So the content will be split into four parts, beginning with early days, which I consider to be from 2014 to 2016. And because I'll cover a bit of dates, I thought it'd be good to visualize them on a timeline such as this to put things into a little bit of perspective here. And so it'd be good to establish a good point of reference for all the dates that we'll cover. And I believe a good point of reference would be Rust 1.0, which is like the first stable release which guarantees us that once you write our code, when we upgrade our Rust toolchain, we're guaranteed that the code won't break, which was often the case in the Rust 0.x releases. However, the first language smartness tool was actually created more than a year prior to that, and dating, initial comment dating back to March 2014, the tool was called Racer, which some of you may probably know. And so I did some Git archeology span and pulled this snippet from one of the initial comments. And as you can see, the syntax remembers a different, different days. So for example, we have uint, which is now usize, if I recall correctly, and we have a syntax for tilde t, which is now a box of t, respectively. So how Racer did this, did this was it used the internal Rust C parser, so called lib syntax. A parser roughly is a program that transforms your source code into some form of a representation that, can, that then can be further analyzed and worked, worked on. And on top of that, it actually bolted a very simple name resolution system. And once you think about this, we can use the name resolution to power one of the staple ID features, such as jump to definition. So in this example, we have a very simple code. If we were to resolve a path A colon colon B, we need to scan the code, see what A refers to. So in this example, we'd, this would be a module A. And then once we resolve that part of the path, we need to, we move on to the next one, so that's B. But then we find the B in the nested scope that's introduced by module A. And once we do that, once we resolve fully the path, and that's obviously oversimplifying, but for the sake of this example, once we have the B, we know that it points to struct B, and so we can jump to that definition in our editor. It also included a completion engine. So we have two types of completion, very simplifying again. One is scope completion, so that's very similar to the name resolution, but instead of actually stopping at one segment and resolving that, we get a list of all the valid possible scopes that are further introduced in that scope, right? But also there is a dot completion, which is a lot more interesting, but to actually correctly do that, we need to have a fully functional type system because a structure can implement a number of traits, each pulling their own methods. And so to get an accurate list of methods that are callable for a given structure, we need to know which exactly traits are implemented for that structure. So you can see how this can get a little bit, a little bit more messy. So Racer did have a very heuristical approach to that, but nothing very complete in the Rust C sense. And it was also designed as a CLI tool, so it wasn't like a daemon or language server as we do have now, most, most of the time. A couple, like a year later, in September 1, 2015, that's the birthday of the IntelliJ plugin for Rust. And then the developers were faced with a decision whether to reuse what they have, 
so that's Razor, or to reuse or to use the set of tools that are introduced by and developed by JetBrains for their IDEs to do their own support for the language. And in the end, the decision was to re-implement their own kind of compiler front end using that set of tools. And a fun fact, it was actually written in Kotlin, so that's uh, JetBrains JVM-based language, which wasn't even 1.0 at this time. So how it actually did, how they actually supported the, the generated the compiler front end is they used the parser generator called GrammarKit from JetBrains, and a quick refresher or in introduction what parser generator is, is that it's a piece of logic that accepts a grammar specification, so that would be a set of rules that define your language. And on the output, you typically get two programs called Lexer and Parser. What well, Lexer does, simpli simplify simplifying, yeah, simplifying, is that it accepts, transforms the stream of characters and outputs a stream of kind of abstract tokens. So in this example, we have let token, which is a keyword, then we have identifier token, which is A, and so on and so forth. What Parser does, is it accepts that stream of tokens, and on the output, it outputs, um, sorry, it outputs um, syntax tree, some form of a representation that then tools and the compiler itself can use to perform further analysis. And these can be, syntax trees can be concrete or abstract, but I won't go into that right now. So having that, they initially had a very limited set of features, but, but as time went on, they added more and more. So initially, they started with a basic name resolution, so that's very simple, similar to what Racer did. As time went on, they, it obviously got improved and, and expanded upon. They also supported indexing. So for example, when you take a final references feature for IDE, what you need to do to actually answer that request, you need to walk the entire crate and see what you know, from the entire source code, what references that, uh, you know, a given definition. So it, did, it, does, it does that, it caches the result, and that's basically roughly what indexing is. They also introduced a cargo integration support, so now IntelliJ plugin knows what a cargo.toml is, how your project is structured, that you can have a workspace of many crates. And what's interesting is that initially they have a very heuristical Based type system, but in 2017, they re-implemented it in Kotlin to be like a real deal, and maybe not on par with what Rust-C has, but something very, very similar, at least aspiring to be complete. But leaving that for now, let's move on to the official Rust ID story, in a way. So this all started when RFC 1317 dubbed ID support was, the PR containing it was opened. So that was in October 2015. And it covered mainly two things. So one is what, how an ID tool looks like, what it does, uh, how does it communicate with editors, and so on. And the other one, the second point is how we can actually extract the data from Rusty itself that powers all the smartness behind the tool. And after a long debate, a couple of, couple of months later, the RFC was merged. And so the bike shedded has been resolved. The name has been picked. So the name Rust Language Server was picked. But actually, the discussion about the data was, around, was re were revolving around two axes, whether we lazily compute the data whether can we adapt Rust-C to have this incremental infrastructure. And then there was no resolution. So was, what was agreed upon was that Rust-C should dump all the data, all the smartness data, and then we can improve the status quo incrementally from there. So coming next to the RLS, which is from between 2016 to 2018, and that's obviously not to say that development has been stopped. It's just that it was most active and defining development going around there then. A prototype was initially created by Nick Cameron and Jonathan Turner in, at the end of August 2016. And what's interesting is that actually for a second, it actually pulled Tokyo and Hyper. So the protocol was based around HTTP. 
rather than what was eventually used, the Microsoft's LSP, which is Language Server Protocol, which didn't exist at a time when the ID was opened and debated. So a couple of days later, it was officially renamed and officially announced at RASCON 2016. And it was designed to be the IDE tool to rule them all, basically. So whichever request you wanted to, well, to request from that tool, it had to be able to answer that. So in order to do that, it actually pulled a couple, sorry, a couple of different tools, such as Racer for the auto-completion, Rust Format for the code formatting, Clippy to integrate with the external linter, and Cargo to orchestrate builds and to detect project layouts. To come back to the data and how we can extract that from the Rust C itself, an additional pass was implemented. That was enabled via the dash Z save analysis flag. And what it meant to do is it meant to save the analysis pass results to a separate file, in this case, JSON. But unfortunately, the name kind of stuck, and we called the data itself save analysis. And that's to show that RLS is actually decoupled from Rust C itself, so it does not rely on the compiler internals as much as Clippy, for example. So whenever we break stuff into Rust C or change the internals, the RLS, thankfully, does not break as often. But since the compilation is always local from the point of view of a given crate, and Rust C cannot, does not know how to compile multiple crates at a single time, at, at the same time, in a single session, we need to lower these multiple JSON blobs into a single coherent view that only then can be used to query by the RLS itself. So to sum it up, the mode of operation is as follows. Whenever a user changes input, so for example, they modify a file, they instruct, RLS instructs Rust C to regenerate the JSON blob, which only then is lowered down to the database which only then can be used to query by RLS. And you can see it takes a bit of time to fully complete the cycle. So to quickly explain the data format that powers the save analysis and the RLS, uh, it was, with time, it was expanded upon, which means the feature set of RLS also has expanded. But initially, it had only definitions and references. So for instance, if Rust C encounters like a struct definition or an enum definition or function, it records all of that into the JSON. And also when it walks to create and it sees references and uses its name resolution pass to find references to an actual definitions, it also records that. So we can use that to power jump the definition. We only need to query a reference in a given location at a cursor. Same thing we have with final references, but we need to traverse the inverse relationship relation of the references to quickly, for a given point of file, find all the references where they all refer to a single definition. But as you said, as time went on, we expanded the data, and we included stuff like trait hierarchy. So we lowered, we recorded every ample block for a given definition. And with this, we could quickly answer queries such as, which traits does a given definition implement? Or roughly, what are the methods that were introduced in impl blocks introduced for a given definition. Also, it saw some niche cases like deglobbing. So when this feature was designed, the glob imports were kind of frowned upon. So what we did is we recorded which exact definitions have been pulled by Rust C itself. And then if a user wants to replace that with actual imports, they can just do that on the spot. Interestingly enough, at one point, it also had the lexical scope borrow data. That was when borrow checker was based on the AST. And that was to visualize all that, all that scopes in the editor, because borrow checker was deemed to be a hurdle for the newcomers. So we wanted to be able to visualize that data so they can more effectively reason about it. But in the end, we know that we will want to move off to the non-lexical lifetime models. So in the end, we just abandoned the data altogether. However, this brings me to completion. And that's a good question, how we can model completion in that, that save analysis model. And the answer is, we can't, really. 
because we'd have to record every possible completion for every expression that is in the crate, which bloats up the save analysis format considerably. And if we, well, we can see that if we have more data, then we need more time to emit that to a file. And when we have more data in the file itself, we need more time to lower that into a single coherent view, as I was mentioned previously. So this, unfortunately, increases the latency that's perceived by the user. And also, it's very hard to model because whenever a user, imagine a user types like let a equals expression dot, how RLS works is it instructs the compiler to redo the compilation on that crate, but that does not parse, right? It's not a valid Rust code. So Rusty just goes, yeah, I don't know what to do with this. And it just omits it and skips it, skips it altogether. Which brings me to RLS 1.0 release candidate, which was announced in the August 2018. So if you remember that times, you can remember that it was not well received. People did agree that it was not ready for 1.0, with main pain points being the high latency and lacking completions at the time. And we kind of sidestepped that issue by just saying, OK, RLS version is the same as the Rust version. So you know we're, we're kind of officially 1.0 and, and past that, but still there work there is work to be done on this end, and so we work continuously to reduce latency and improve product support and in general improve RLS as we go. Which brings me to Rust Analyzer, which is a very interesting project that had seen its birth in 2018. It all started with RFC called libsyntax 2.0, which was open at the end of 2017. And what this RFC proposed is to introduce a parser that would output not AST, but a concrete syntax tree. So that's literally how the Rust source code was parsed, including comments and any other tokens. And you can see how this can be useful for different tools, for example, for a Rust format or even ID that needs to answer like requests, for example, extract a given function outside of the scope, including the comments and whatnot. In the meantime, the incremental infrastructure has matured and the Rusty, which was not originally accounted for or considered in the original RFC in 2015. And it's the first stable release of incremental compilation has landed with stable Rust 1.24 release, which was in February 2018. And it turned out to, the design turned out to be very good. And so it inspired another crate called Salsa, which, yeah, <laughs> whew. So it's, the initial comments dated back to September 2018. And it basically models a functions, a queries which are functions from type K to type V of two different types. One type is inputs, so we can think of this as a function that pulls value outside from the environment. And the, uh, another type is a pure function, which can be thus memoized or cached, because a pure function, the result of a pure function only depends on the input, solely on the input. We can see in practice how this can work in the ID setting or the compiler. For example, if we type check a given definition or a body, we don't need to do it again if something else changed in the source code that does not affect the definition for which the work has already been done. And so with this combined, with the research work that's, that went into Libsyndex2 and Salsa, we actually had a pretty functional tool. We have a tool that was able to parse Rust source code and output a syntax tree that then was analyzed using the Salsa database. One of the main goals for the Rust analyzer was to explore how an ID-ready compiler front-end might look like. Especially, it emphasized laziness heavily. As I said, you don't need to, with this lazy approach, as Salsa demonstrated, we don't need to redo most of our work. Comparison in, contra in contrary to the RLS, where when you modify something very slightly, you still need to recompile everything and lower everything into the single coherent database. One of the goals is to reuse what we can. So we do not aim to re-implement the type checker. Instead, we want to reuse chalk, which is 
uh, reimagined sort of type system for, for Rust-C that's implemented outside of the actual compiler. And another goal is to be separate, completely separate from Rust-C, which is both good and bad. So Rust Analyzer fully compiles on stable, and this greatly improves the contributability factor. So to give you an example, on my fairly recent laptop, building Rust-C from ground up with debug settings takes an hour and 20 minutes. So you can see how that can scare off potential contributors. But on the other hand, we don't have parity with Rust-C, so we don't accept the same set of programs that Rust-C does, and we don't get the same diagnostics. So to quickly recap, the mode of operation comparison to DRLS is that whenever a user change, changes inputs, Rust Analyzer only informs the salsa of that, and then whenever a user asks something of Rust Analyzer, only then it asks the salsa to do it, thus doing the, min the minimal amount of work necessary. So the, prog the progress is that Rust Analyzer mostly works, which is great. It actually handles the Rust compiler repository itself, which I consider to be a great milestone. And recently, macro expansion has improved by quite a lot, so we support a considerably, considerate, considerably big subset of real-life Rust code, including Rust standard library. But on the other hand, we don't still have diagnostics, and we sidestep this by running cargo check on the side. And also, stuff that needs indexing does not work it, so, for example, final references feature. Now, around the beginning of 2019, a working group dubbed RLS 2.0 has been formed somewhat organically at the Rust All Hands, which was in February. And the goal was to be an experiment to see how Rust-C itself can be adapted to be more of a IDE ready in that sense. And they based the work on the Rust analyzer, what we have already. One of the other goals was to libraryfy Rust-C as to find in how we can split and modularize Rust-C into more fine-grained and pure crates and, and interface and contrary to what we have right now, which is just a big of bunch of crates that just happen to work. And also, somewhat of a secondary nature is how we can bridge those two tools as to not to be so confusing for the end user when it comes to the ID support. So the first fruit of the work for the working group was the Rusty underscore lecture crate, which was merged upstream in July 2019, this year. And what it actually did is the PR was open that pruned all of the Elixir code that relied on the internals of Rust-C and replaced it with fully stable compiling code, which actually means that we can now share the same Elixir code across the compiler itself and the Rust analyzer, which is great. Which brings me to today. What do we do today? We obviously continue to improve the existing tools separately and together, so separately Rust language server and the Rust analyzer. But we do try to unify the ID effort as in not to be so confusing for the end user. For instance, RLS and Rust analyzer have their own virtual file system implementations or their own LSP server implementations, so we plan to cut down on that and share hopefully more code rather than less. And Rust-C itself sees a lot of cleanups internally, so who knows? Maybe something like name resolution will be extracted into a separate crate in the near future. This brings me back to my first opening question. Are we IDE yet? I'd say not yet, but we're very, very close. So you'll have to just bear with us for a little bit longer. Thank you. <laughs>